All right, everyone, we'll begin. So good morning and welcome to our very first N Park Spotlight featuring the creatures of the night. My name is Leslie. I'm a manager at the National Biodiversity Centre of the National Parks Board, and I will be your host for today. We are very excited to bring you this new series. Each week, our in-house experts will be sharing about different types of biodiversity and habitats, and you can tune in online. So right now, we have an audience joining us from Zoom and our YouTube live stream. So this is our program for today. We are very honored to have Mr. Lim Liang Jim, Group Director of the National Biodiversity Center, open this session with an introduction to the Nature Conservation Master Plan. We will then get the ball rolling with a quiz. So have your smartphones ready. Next, NBC's Biodiversity Manager, Ms. Li Tianjiao, will share about the creatures of the night. Now, if you have any questions during this time, you can share them for our Q&A right after. Those on Zoom, you can send me, Leslie, a private message using the chat function. And those watching on our YouTube live stream can share your comments, can share your questions in the comments below. Do note that in the interest of time, we will only be able to present a few questions before concluding the session. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Lim Yang Jim to give us an overview of the Nature Conservation Master Plan. Take it away, Jim. Hi, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Jim. Uh, I see that there are about 70 of you and these are really great numbers for a Saturday morning. Uh, although days don't mean anything to us nowadays. Um, so what I, I'd like to do is um, before starting off this entire series, right? Uh, where our experts talk to you about local biodiversity, uh, I want to set it in context. And the context is um, uh, what is NPARCS? What is the nation? What is Singapore doing? to conserve its uh, nature. So uh, before going into the details of you know, what these critters are and how awesome they are, uh, I think a lot of people will have questions. Yeah, okay, they are really awesome, but what do we really do uh, in terms of nature conservation in Singapore? Uh, strangely enough, although this is out in the public domain, not a whole lot of people uh, know that. Uh, and you guys are great. Uh, you're lucky because at the beginning of this session, and I won't be repeating this every week, uh, we, we will give you uh, an overview of what we are actually doing and what is the structure under which we practice nature conservation in Singapore uh, as a government agency. So look at this first slide first, and uh, I want to see that this is um, unique in the world. No other place in the world will you have a vista, which is literally a green matrix, right, enveloping uh, urban infrastructure. And, and this is the entire point behind Singapore's a city in nature vision, right? Uh, it has progressed from garden city to city in a garden. And as you can see, the, the, the trees here have grown over 50 years. And what we are looking at uh, and what we are striving to achieve is a city in nature. Uh, be better sounding than city in a jungle, uh, safer sounding, but uh, much, much more of an integrated matrix of uh, very nice greenery, very nice flora and fauna, try to be as native as possible. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and I think there are several misconceptions that I always try to address. Uh, and the very first misconception is that uh, greenery was lost uh, ever since we became a developed nation in uh, the year 1965 and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, as you can see here, the first misconception and the one that many, many people have uh, when, you, when you go to several fora, when you talk about it, when you go to Facebook, uh, we have actually lost our forest, primary forest. Uh, and you can see that little line, if you click the button again, you can see that most of our primary forests have been lost uh, by 1930. 99% of our primary forests have been lost since 1930, simply because, you know, uh, when Stanford Raffles came over uh, to Singapore, it, it really was to set up Singapore uh, as a huge plantation for spices, to grow things. Uh, later on, when rubber became a thing, basically the rubber plantations took over everything. So <clears throat> uh, the Botanic Gardens was actually the research center for rubber cultivation in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, Singapore became a large rubber plantation after that together with spices. We had lost most of our forests uh, by the year 1930. But uh, 
at the same time, some of it had been uh, conserved or left untouched. And ever since we uh, became the National Parks Board, we have striven to basically bring them up uh, as much as possible to restore and conserve and protect those habitats. So next slide. And we still have a wealth of ecosystems, both terrestrial and marine, and I'll go through them very quickly. For terrestrial systems, we have uh, marshes, inland water bodies, a lot of it in the Western catchment. We have primary and secondary rainforests. Uh, we have streams and rivers, uh, and you hear about uh, that when we are starting to talk about our uh, crabs, the small crabs that uh, live in our hill streams. Uh, at the same time, we have open grassland. So those are still found within uh, the protected areas in Singapore within our nature reserves and nature parks. Uh, for marine ecosystems, we have, of course, uh, the mangrove swamps, uh, which are very easy to see. If you go to Sungai Bulo, uh, we have mud flats, we have uh, seagrass beds uh, on the offshore islands, and we have coral reefs underwater, right? So uh, those are the ones that you can see if you go diving, if you go to Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, if you go to our sister's island marine park. Okay. Um, and of course, you have a wealth of terrestrial plants, and a lot of this selection that you see here are not just native. Uh, some of them are actually endemic, found nowhere else in the world but Singapore. Uh, also, terrestrial animals, right? So terrestrial animals, uh, a small selection here. Some of them you will see in Tian Chao's presentation later on. Coastal and marine, same thing. You have uh, specific plants specific to the coastal and marine areas. Uh, some of them are extremely rare now. Some of them are found only in Singapore or at least only in this region, right? Uh, same as coastal and marine animals. And uh, throughout the series, you will have speakers also to talk about the coastal and marine animals that you find uh, on the shores of Singapore as well as underwater. Yeah. <clears throat> so what do we do? We have found out early on that we need to take positive action to ensure that our native biodiversity, all the ecosystems and the species, uh, not just survive, but thrive. And in order to do that, you can't just go around randomly doing uh, stuff. You need to have a structure. So this is the structure that we introduced in 2015. And the structure is the Nature Conservation Master Plan. Uh, and very broadly, it is divided into uh, four key focus areas, four trusts that we call it. Number one, conservation of key habitats. Number two, habitat enhancement, restoration, and species recovery. Number three, a solid foundation of research and science. And number four, bringing the people into it to be part of this plan, right? So um, just, go, just going through it very quickly, uh, number one thing we do is to safeguard and strengthen our core areas. So our Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, our Central Catchment Nature Reserve, our Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, Labrador Nature Park. Uh, these are our key ecosystems that we protect as nature reserves, right? So this is a shot of Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, and you can see that uh, the dipro cups are there, they look like cauliflowers, or rather they look like broccoli heads, right? Uh, so so that, that is an artifact of uh, a lowland rainforest, and uh, we will be talking about that as part of the series as well. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> and in order to protect them uh, from uh, the artifacts of being too small and drying out at the edges, as well as people uh, visiting them too often and causing a little bit of impact, we have to secure and enhance buffer areas. And that we have done uh, through the construction and the establishment uh, of the nature parks system. So now we have a whole bunch of nature parks which uh, have surrounded the central catchment as well as uh, adjacent to the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And those uh, provide a greater footprint to expand the area of the nature reserves, but at the same time uh, provide um, alternative outlets for nature-based recreation. So if you want to ride your mountain bike, uh, the Chestnut and Dairy Farm Nature Parks allow you to do that. If you want to go for a nice walk, Thompson Nature Park is very, very nice. So it brings a lot of footfall outside of the core nature uh, reserves into the nature parks so that, uh, again, uh, the core areas experience less foot traffic. So this is what we've been doing for the past five years. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> And in order to basically create a, a matrix, right, it can't just be the large clumps of greenery. In between them, we also want to establish uh, additional nodes. They are like stepping stones in between the larger big green spaces. So we create uh, parks and we enhance uh, habitats and restore certain habitats in certain larger parks. So for example, Fusionopolis, it was supposed to be a Silicon Valley of Singapore. We didn't just want it to be all buildings, right? 
So we had a piece of uh, a land that was given to us to establish a park and we put up a planting pallet, which resulted in this, what you can see now, uh, specifically planted to attract pollinators, bees, birds, butterflies, dragonflies, so that they can serve as uh, additional refugia for animals that want to cross from one big area to another. And how do these uh, animals cross? Uh, we also then have to put in ecological corridors, right? So the next slide will show you how we basically do ecological corridors. In the old days, uh, as some of us can recall, the planting scheme was fairly simple. It was big trees and underneath that grass. Uh, in many, many, many kilometers of roadways now in our streetscapes, we have introduced nature ways. We have now more than 100 kilometers of nature ways and that uh, attempts to emulate a forest structure. And it's really, really cool. So there will be an emergent layer, you know, where the trees stick out. There will be a canopy layer where a lot of the animals move through. Uh, there is an uh, understory layer, right, where basically a lot of that uh, green wall is. And underneath that, there is also shrubbery. So it's actually four layers and it emulates a forest structure. And if you can see from this photograph, if the trees aren't enough, the buildings behind that, we also encourage them and incentivize them to put in some vertical greenery and rooftop greenery. So it also serves as an emergent layer. The trees are also specially selected. The plants are specially selected so that it is mm, a lot of native plants, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of flowering plants that allow uh, pollinators, uh, birds that like to uh, drink nectar, uh, uh, insects that like to drink nectar, and then there are predator animals to come in and just have a little bit of uh, support for these animals when they are using these ecological connections. So in so doing, uh, what do we see? We see that uh, uh, in Singapore, rather than to have a hinterland, which is a big green protected area, which we are unable to do because we are only 710, 720 square kilometers, we actually have an entire green matrix and we are intending to expand that green matrix so that the core areas are serviced by smaller stepping stone green areas and overlaying all that is a very well thought out and considered ecological network, right? So uh, this is what we are hoping to achieve and we have done quite a lot of that already. Okay, um, so the next thrust is of course, uh, habitat enhancement, restoration and species recovery. Along the way, along the years, uh, we have had certain habitats which had been basically um, compromised one way or another. And in those habitats, what we try to do is to bring back and help nature, basically give it a little bit of a kickstart so that nature can recover. Uh, we have done that at Pulau Tekong. We have observed that uh, along the northern coast of Pulau, Pulau Tekong, the, um, some of the erosion had taken away a patch of mangrove forest. We actually had a scheme to replant it. It took a lot of research uh, to make sure that the replanting was successful. You can see the pots there. The pots were actually specially constructed and made out of a biodegradable rice husk uh, so that as the saplings grow, it will slowly uh, dissolve away. And uh, uh, right now, a lot of these mangroves have recovered along the shore. Uh, they were protected as well. Uh, by bakau poles that we put up so that uh, basically the backwash from the boat waves uh, don't get to them and kill them too young. And as you can see, a lot of these sponges and marine life had actually established themselves along the coastlines and the rocks as well. All right, so this is one example of a habitat enhancement program. Now, uh, where uh, everything had been uh, uh, urbanized before and we have an uh, opportunity to work with other agencies to bring back a habitat, uh, we can do that also. That's on a far larger scale. Uh, and uh, of course, the prime example of that is Bishan Amokyo Park. It used to be this uh, large concretized canal and uh, working together with that, we had basically turned it into a freshwater river floodplain. And uh, of course, this is the flagship of PUB as well as N Parks, whereby uh, everything had been taken care of. Uh, an ecosystem has been restored. Nowadays, you see birders coming in because rare birds like open bill stalks and, and um, mangrove pitas can come in and rest. And at the same time, of course, uh, there is a family of otters here. And they were very successful in the early days simply because uh, this ecosystem was restored and there was a lot of fish and a lot of hiding opportunities uh, for them to uh, resource themselves and then build the family. Right? So habitat restoration. Now, uh, coming on to the third point behind this is species recovery. A lot of the animals that you will hear in our series of talks 
over the next several Saturdays, we'll focus on animals that we have uh, selected uh, for species recovery. Some of them, a lot of people in Singapore do not know about. So this is a special opportunity. So the first thing we do is to categorize it, right? So the first priority is endemic species, species found nowhere else in the world. Uh, you will see this little crab. It is the Johora singaporensis found nowhere else in the world amongst the rarest species of crabs uh, in the entire world. And we have had a species recovery uh, program that is very successful for that, right? Uh, and then following that, uh, those that are critically endangered or recently uh, discovered. So you can see the Neptune's cup sponge and the Raffles banded langur. Uh, there are plans to basically help their populations grow one way or another. Okay, so following that, <clears throat> we do not do anything in end parks without the support of very strong scientific baselines. So uh, when people either uh, above us at the politician level or below us at public, uh, ask us, why do you do the things that you do? We can then say that this was all founded on a very strong foundation and background of data we've collected over the years. So the key thing that we do when we are talking about research is biodiversity surveys to find out uh, what is where, what is rare, what is cool, what species need protection. We need to collect a lot of data. Uh, and of course, in the old days, uh, it used to be literally people going down to the ground and uh, looking at things and catching things and surveying things. Uh, but Singapore is one of the very, very few places in the world whereby we uh, really, really uh, trust and uh, put great stock in the use of technology to basically uh, give us a leg up on the game, basically to uh, expand the scope of what we are able to do and to have productivity in our research. So, we use a lot of technology and you can see now that uh, with technology such as um, camera traps uh, with night vision capability, you can see things that we never used to see before simply because they are either too high up in the trees or occur at night. You see the third image at the bottom there, porcupines. Porcupines were very, very difficult to see. We had really very little idea of whether they were there and how many there were, but with camera trapping, we are able to see this image of three little porcupines uh, not only occurring in Singapore, but using a culvert, which we had specifically put up for animals to cross. So not only does it uh, give us an idea of what there was, but whether our interventions like culverts are actually successful. So there's a lot of data that you can glean out of that. Uh, moving into the realm of night vision, we had then purchased night vision scopes, and Tianjia will tell you about basically what we could see with these night vision scopes. Uh, and a lot of insight in the ecology, uh, as well as the occurrence of animals in our nature reserves. Yeah. Okay, so going moving forward, what we intend to do, of course, is to then make a lot of use of uh, drones, both uh, aerial drones as well as underwater. Uh, environmental DNA is the great new game changer now. One drop of water can tell you whatever's that been swimming inside. Uh, as well as acoustic sensors, uh, both for terrestrial, so that you can hear things that are hiding in the canopy, triangulate them, find out how many of them there are, uh, find out how far away they are, how often they occur, as well as underwater, so that you can look for things like dolphins. Okay, uh, and, and that's really cool technology. So uh, what's the final trust? The final trust is something like this that you're sitting at listening uh, right now. It's outreach, is to make people understand what Singapore has, uh, what is precious to us, what sort of nature that we have, uh, and to bring it down to all levels, uh, from children at a school level, preschool level, all the way to the university level, as well as try as much as possible to bring that message to the heartlands, to show people in the heartlands that uh, Singapore has a great deal of biodiversity, and not a lot of people know that when we have our annual festival of biodiversity, which we hold in the heartlands, a lot of people come down and say, wow, I did not know that you had all these things. So it is very important to basically reach out uh, as broadly and as deeply as possible to the community and then co-op the community and get them to come and join us uh, in a national movement to basically help conserve our greenery uh, and help conserve our biodiversity, right? Um, and, and the schools are doing great, great work. We have a network of about 400 to 500 schools and some of them are really, really doing amazing work. This is Commonwealth Secondary School and, and what they have done is to recreate an entire wetland within their schools. So this year we were supposed to have a, 
a schools award whereby we gave gave awards to the, the best schools and the best school teachers and recognize their contribution uh, in participating in our programs and to instill a, a, a bit of uh, nature awareness uh, to their students, right? So, so that's that's what we do. And at the, at the same time, of course, in the end, how do we celebrate ourselves? How do we report this? How do we monitor this? Uh, we actually have an index which has been adopted by the UN and now uh, many, many cities are practicing it. It is a Singapore index and it's specific to monitoring uh, the biodiversity and the services that biodiversity uh, can provide to cities in the world. So it's not just countries, but it's cities, right? It is self-assessment. It is easy to apply. It's objective and fair. And it has really cool things like uh, in the next slide, you can see uh, uh, basically categories whereby you note down the ecosystem services, which is very important because people will keep asking, what does all this biodiversity mean for human beings, right? So what sort of benefits does it provide to human beings? It's all about human beings when you're talking about city. Because in order to get human beings interested, you have to say what's in it for them. So ecosystem services, very important. And of course, one very important point is governance. How are people taking care of their biodiversity? How are people planning to conserve their biodiversity in that city? And of course, governance and management, uh, if they have a, a plan, if you have something to look forward to moving forward, then you score higher points there. So there are many indicators. And these are all very useful indicators, right? So <clears throat> what we can see is, and I've been harping over this point, it's not just about biodiversity because if you want to apply uh, conservation of biodiversity in a city index, we have to make sure that it translates into people being happy with what they see uh, and people uh, uh, increasing the benefits, right? When they are living together with nature. And it's all about livability uh, at the end. So this is the end of my speech. It's, it's, it's taken longer than I wanted to. Uh, and hopefully you have an understanding of the context when our experts go in, like Tian Chao, to talk about all the nature that you see and all the things that you don't uh, commonly experience. Uh, and you may ask yourself, yeah, so what are people doing about all this? And uh, this is a very nice backgrounder of what we are doing and why we are doing it. So thank you very much. And I hope that everybody signs up and enjoy the uh, speaker series. Uh, and uh, I think take it away, Tian Chao. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jim. So Jim is a busy man and I think he has to leave for another event. So we're really glad that he took the time to join us today. So thank you once again. So the Nature Conservation Master Plan outlines our strategies for biodiversity conservation and part of it involves getting people to appreciate biodiversity. So to get us excited to learn about the creatures of the night, we'll have a short quiz. So to our viewers on YouTube, unfortunately, due to the slight lag with the live streams, you will not be able to take part in the quiz, but you can watch the action and learn a few facts along with us. So to join the quiz, use your smartphone to either scan the QR code or type kahoot.it into your web browser. And you will then be asked to key in the game pin. So I'll just give you a moment to scan the code or type kahoot.it and I will be sharing the game screen. All right, so in a moment, I will be sharing the game screen. Okay, so just a little bit more time for people to join. So how this will go is that there are five multiple choice questions. The question and four possible options will appear on my screen. You will then have to click the correct option on your own phone. Try to answer as fast as you can for more points. And also do note that there might be more than one correct answer accepted for the questions. All right, so I think we will begin. So the first question. I live at forest fringes and am active at dusk. What am I? What is this animal in the picture? Is it a babirusa, a warthog, a wild boar, 
or Pumba, our friend from the Lion King. And the correct answer is a wild boar. So one fun fact about the wild boar is that the young are striped and some say they look like little watermelons. All right, let's see. Okay, we have our leaderboard over here. Next question. I can glide from tree to tree. What am I? What is this animal in the picture? Is it a Malayan kolugo, a flying fox, a flying lima, or a flying squirrel? Okay, the correct answer is a Malayan kulugo or a flying lemur. Although flying lemur can be a bit of a confusing name as they are not capable of true powered flight, meaning that they don't flap their wings like birds. They actually rely on a skin to help them glide, or glide through the air. And they're also not related to the lemurs of Madagascar. Okay. Third question. On average, approximately how much does a leopard cat weigh? Is it 5 kg? 15, 1, 5 kg? 50, 5, 0 kg? Or 100 kg? And the correct answer is 5 kg. So in Singapore and tropical Southeast Asia, leopard cats are very small, about the size of a domestic cat. So they tend to weigh between 1 to 5 kg. Although in some temperate regions like parts of China and Russia, they can be a bit larger, like up to like about 7 kg. Okay. Question four. Which of the following is true about the Sunda slow loris? It is a type of primate. It is venomous. It can only move slowly like a sloth. It eats insects. Okay, so there are three correct answers here. The slow loris is a, the only venomous primate that we have in Singapore. And aside from insects, it can also eat fruits, nectar, and sap from plants. All right, so time for our final question. Which of the following is part of a Sunda pangolin's natural diet? Fruits, leaves and flowers, ants and termites, or small lizards? Okay, so the Sunda pangolin is insectivorous and it feeds on the adults and larvae of ants and termites. And in fact, it actually has a long sticky tongue to help it reach into ant nests. So let's see our winners. In third place, we have Guni. <laughs> Second place, R. And on top, we have... Nasri, congratulations to our winners and thank you everyone for taking part. Now, we will be moving on to the next part of our presentation. Okay, so we've all learned a little bit about some creatures of the night and right now we'll hear more about them from Miss Lee Tiantiao, who is a biodiversity manager from the terrestrial branch of NBC. So remember, if you have questions, you may submit them via the Zoom chat or in the YouTube comments, and we'll present a few during the Q&A later. So take it away, Ken Jia. Yay. Okay, right. So, a very good morning to all of you. Thanks for giving up on your comfortable beds on a rainy, rainy Saturday morning. But I promise you that you won't regret because you are going to hear about some of the most amazing animals in Singapore that you never have seen in your lives. 
Um, so just a little bit of information about myself. I've been with MPAC since um, 2013. And for the past three to four years, I have been doing quite extensive surveys on one of the most cryptic animals in Singapore, which I will also be talking about later on in my talk. And when I'm doing surveys in the forest, I do come across quite a lot of other animals as well. And I just want to take this opportunity to share with you some of these animals and um, where can you find it in Singapore, right? So um, we all know that Singapore is a small um, island, but and we have lost about 99% of our primary rainforest in history. But what we have left in the remaining pockets of our forest, we do have quite amazing biodiversity. And many of these animals are actually native to Singapore, which means that they have been on our island since the start of history. In fact, we do have about 61 species of mammals. We have many spiders, butterflies, dragonflies, and damselflies. And we also have six species of freshwater crabs, and of which three of them are endemic. So endemic means that they can only be found in Singapore and nowhere else in the world. Our bird diversity is also very good. We have more than 400 species of them. And of course, we have our amphibians and reptiles as well. So most of these animals are um, found in our nature reserves, as well as our nature parks, which acts as very, very good buffers in between our urban areas and our core forests. And now zooming in into the mammals part, um, out of all the 61 species of um, native mammals in Singapore, you can see that actually more than 80% of them are all terrestrial, which means that you can find them on land. But we also have a small handful of marine mammals as well, which includes our dolphins and our dugongs. And we have two amazing semi-aquatic mammals, which are no other than our iconic otters, our smooth-coated otters, as well as our Asian small crawled otters. And within the 87% um, of these terrestrial mammals, more than three quarters of them are actually nocturnal. And the rest are either diurnal or crepuscular. Pre um, if you want to ask me how I came about with these numbers, you can ask me at the end of the talk because I might talk another 20 minutes just to explain how I get these numbers from. Right, so what do the terms actually mean? They actually refer to the type of activity patterns that each of the animals have. And this applies not only to the mammals, it also applies to the amphibians and the reptiles as well. So for diurnal mammals, it means that they're actually active mostly during the day and they sleep at night, which is similar to humans. Whereas for the nocturnal mammals, they are the direct opposite. They only come at night to look for food. And during the daytime, they usually hide in the trees to sleep. But we do have a group of um, interesting animals that are crepuscular. And instead of being mostly out in the daytime or in the nighttime, what they do is they're active during the twilight hours, which are very, very short. So for these animals, they will come out um, during the dawn and during the dusk. But this doesn't mean that they are totally inactive during the day. It's just that they are um, quite low in their metabolic rates, so they tend to not move around so much. So um, these are some examples of the different animals in the different uh, activity groups. You can see that for nocturnal mammals, they are mostly made up of two main groups of animals, which are our squirrels and our macaques. And this is also the reason why you tend to see more of these animals when you go out in the parks and in the forest, because the activity patterns of these mammals, they follow that of human beings. Whereas um, the other animals, they are mostly sleeping when you're out. But um, examples of the nocturnal mammals that we have will include our civets. And this is uh, an example of a civet, which is the common palm civet, mostly seen in our reserve, but sometimes also in urban areas. And <clears throat> another good example is our bats. So um, I was talking about the crepuscular animals, which are quite special. And um, a good representative of them is the lesser mouse deer. Um, similar to the lesser mouse deer, the wow wow is also uh, active mainly during the twilight hours, and um, which is why you see them uh, when people are going out to have a dinner and things like that. So now we are bringing you to a very interesting question, which is how about humans? Which group of animals do you think humans belong to? Um, I will consider myself to be 70% diurnal and 30% nocturnal because the fact that I go out into the forest for surveys uh, during nighttime. It shows that, you know, I'm partly no nocturnal as well. Right. 
So you can think about what kind of um, animal are you. Right. So now I'll go on to talk about the, the four animals that uh, I have seen in the forest during my survey. Actually, not all of them, but uh, some of them. Right. So the first animal that I'll be talking about is none other than the Malay Kolugo. The Malay Kolugo, um, the distribution in the world is mostly in the Southeast Asia regions. And within Singapore, you can find them in our core nature reserve, which is the Central Catchment Nature Reserve, as well as the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And we also see them in our nature parks surrounding the uh, nature reserves. So how do you tell apart a Kologo from other animals in the forest? Firstly, you can look out for their very, very large eyes with a white ring that is surrounding them. And the most distinguishing feature of a Kologo is actually their skin membrane, which extends from its neck uh, along its body, past its limbs and all, joining all the way to its tail. And one interesting fact about the Kalugo is that we actually have two different color morphs in Singapore. One of them is more um, grayish and the other one is more reddish brown. And it has been said that uh, usually a pale gray uh, Kalugo is a female and a reddish brown one is a male, but it's not always the case because some of the male Kalugos can also be gray in color. And besides the coloration, the Kolugo also evolved uh, long limbs with large claws, which allows them to climb up the trees, which is uh, very important for their habit. And what are some of the characteristics of the Kalugos? So they occur mainly in the tropical forest because they depend on the trees to glide and to look out for food. And they are also solitary, which means that they prefer to be out on their own instead of being in pairs or in family groups. They are mostly arboreal, so uh, during the daytime, they will be up on the trees, and at the nighttime, they will be gliding from tree to trees to look for food. When they are on the trees, they also make use of their strong, strong claws to cling onto the tree trunk, or they can, they can even suspend from bunches during the daytime. And uh, I'm going to be showing you a video of the Kalugo hopping up a tree. And you can see how it uses its sharp claws to cling onto the branches to do that. Okay, it's a very short video. So you can see that it uses a hopping motion. And for this particular Kalugo, it's actually peeing at the same time as he moves up the tree. Okay, I'm going to replay the video again. So he actually raises, you know, his tail when it's climbing up and uh, also because it's peeing. Okay, so the diet of the Kologo is herbivorous. So they feed on various parts of the plants, including the leaves, the shoots, flowers, sets, and fruit. So any part of the plant can be a food for the Kologo. So I mentioned just now that the most distinguishing feature about this animal is actually its skin membrane and um, it stretches from the, its neck all the way to its tail. So this skin membrane actually uh, is called a patagium, and it's precisely because of this membrane that the Kalugo is able to glide from tree to tree when the membrane is um, fully extended. And it can travel as far as 70 meters in one glide, but research has also shown that um, I think the longest that they have ever glided is about 150 meters, right? So um, some of the people who have seen Kologos in a while sometimes also confuse them for the uh, flying squirrels because from far you can just see an animal flying from tree to tree actually gliding and you don't really know what it is. But it's actually um, quite easy to tell them apart from the flying squirrels because from, for the flying squirrels, their long bushy tail is actually exposed outside of the membrane whereas for the Kologo, it's completely enveloped inside. And also for the flying squirrels, the membrane is actually only attached all the way to the wrist of the squirrel instead of to the end of the fingertips. So that is one of the major difference between a flying squirrel and the Kalugo. So this is a video of how the Kalugo glides from tree to tree. It is a bit wobbly, but you can still see its motion in flight. So this is the same Kalugo as the one just now. Okay. I'm going to play it again. 
Okay, so you can see that you, you will actually uh, look out for this destination before prepare to fly. And at the end of the video, you can see a small head popping out because this is the Koloko mummy carrying his baby around when he flies. And another interesting fact about the Kalogo is that even though they are placental mammals, which means that the babies actually develop fully in the uterus or the womb of the mother and derive all their nutrients from the placenta, but the Kalogo actually raise their young similar to marsupials. And one good example of a marsupial that all of us know is the kangaroo or the wallaby found in Australia. So for the Kalugos, they are able to make use of their skin membrane to fold it into a pouch, which also acts as a protection for their babies. But this pouch is different from that of the marsupials because it's not a true pouch. It doesn't develop on the, the belly itself, but it's actually um, folded from the skin membrane. So with this, they can actually um, protect their babies when they <clears throat> hop up the trees and glide around. And also the babies will use their strong claws to cling onto the bellies of the of the, um, the mummies so that they don't fall out during the flight. Right, so luckily for us, the Sunda, uh, sorry, the Malayan Kalugo is not actually threatened for now, although there's the population numbers in the world is slowly decreasing, mainly due to habitat loss. And interestingly, in West Java, it has also been studied that some of the um, local people, they actually do poach the Kalugos for food. So what can you do to help these Kalugos in Singapore? You can do so by not harvesting any plants or plant parts in the forest because you never know that that might just become an important food source for the Kalugos. Okay, right. So now I'll move on to the second animal which most of you will have seen either in newspaper reports or in YouTube videos or if you're lucky enough, sometimes along the roads outside shopping centers. And this animal is none other than the Sunda pangolin. The Sunda pangolin has a distribution which is very similar to the Malayan kolugo. It's also found in Southeast Asia. And in the world, there's actually eight species of pangolins. Um, four of them are found in Asia. And within Singapore, the Sunda pangolin is also found in our core nature reserves. But it is also um, recorded from our offshore islands, which is Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tekong. And besides these three, um, there's also a good population of them in the Western catchment area. And of course, we have um, heard from Facebook posts and YouTube videos that people tend to see pangolins moving around in more urban areas, like for example, NTU, even sometimes in construction sites or along the roads. So it shows that they, they are a bit more urbanized than the other animals. And the tuna pangolin is very is a very distinct animal, and at one look you will know that it's a is a pangolin. And one reason for that is because of its very prominent olive brown scales. Besides the scales, the Sunda pangolin also has a very long tail adapted for grasping. So even though the tail looks very thick and bulky, it's actually able to curl its tail and um, facilitate it when it climbs up the trees. It has a slender head and a feet with very strong claws. For the Sunda pangolin, it also occurs mainly in the tropical forest, but um, like I've said, it can be found in more scrubby areas as well, as well as the urban landscapes of Singapore. They are also solitary, they like to be on their own, mostly ground dwelling, but in the daytime, they like to climb trees and sleep in the tree holes and by rolling into a ball. And sometimes you can see the mothers carrying the babies around on their back. So you can imagine how strong the back and tail muscles of these pangolins are. Now, compared to the Kalugos, the diet of the, the Sunda pangolin is actually more restricted. They are insectivorous and they only eat the adult and larvae of ants and termites. So it's actually a very, very specialized diet. And to support them in this um, diet, they have evolved various structures to help them catch their prey. And one of these structures is these strong claws for ripping apart the end and termite nest. Because these mouths can be tall and they can be very hard. So if they are unable to break them apart, they can't really get to the ends inside. And once they break up the mouths, 
they also need a structure to be able to lick off all the ants that are hiding deep inside the holes and crevices. So um, because of this, they have evolved a long and sticky tongue, which is very effective in getting the ants out of these things. So I'm going to show you a video of how the pangolin moves around looking for prey. And at the end of the video, you can actually see it sticking out its tongue to lick. So in this video, the pangolin is moving up a, I think a rock and it's trying to lick off ants from the inside. So for this part, you can see it's sticking out its tongue, trying to look for food. Right. And um, if you ever wondered how the pangolin got its name from, now you get the answer to it. He actually derived his name from a Malay word called the pangulong, which actually means a roller or a ball. So um, they are called this because when the pangolins are threatened, what they do is they will tuck their head uh, inside of the tummies and use their tail to wrap around them so that from the outside, it actually looks like a ball. And this ball is surrounded by the hard keratin scales, which is a very, very good armor to defend against their predators. Just imagine you are a snake and you want to eat this animal, but once you bite into the skin of it, you realize, oh my gosh, the skill is so hard and you'll probably give up after a while. So that's how the pangolins get away from their predators. Okay. Unfortunately, the pangolin is one of the most traffic mammal in the world and um, the reason for driving that is because of the belief that the scales are useful in the traditional Chinese medicine. So for the pangolin, this conservation status is critically endangered both in Singapore and worldwide. But, uh, and you can also see that uh, just last year, we had two record hauls of pangolin scales together with ivory. One was in April and the other one is in July. So this actually shows that um, the demand for the pangolin skills is still going high around the world. But um, the good news is that just start of the week, China has announced that um, it is going to that it is they are going to remove pangolin skills from the list of approved traditional Chinese medicine. And at the same time, they are also increasing the protective status of the Sunda pangolin to uh, and other pangolins to the highest level. So this is definitely good news for the pangolin because if you're able to curb this demand, then uh, it's hopeful that the illegal poaching activities will drop over time. Within Singapore, we um, don't have uh, a lot of illegal poaching cases, but the number one factor for um, endangering them is actually road kill, because we do have an extensive network of uh, roads and infrastructure. So uh, you can help to conserve the sunder pangolins by number one, not buying any pangolin products like the meat and the scales, and please help to spread the message around so that more people will get to know why you're not um, allowed to do so. And of course, if you are a driver, you can do so by driving carefully along the roads and watch out for the wildlife near forested areas. And this will protect not only the sunder pangolin, but also other ground dwelling mammals in our nature reserves. And luckily for us, um, we do have a Singapore Pangolin Working Group, which is established in 2014. So this working group is made up of um, members from the government, from the NGOs, from the academics, and various other stakeholders. And this group, together with some breeding specialists from IUCN, we got together in a meeting in 2017. And in 2018, um, they published the National conservation strategy and action plan for the Sunda pangolins. So this plan has um, extensive um, actions and objectives or um, about how to conserve this important species in Singapore. And some of the goals that we have includes um, doing extensive research on these species, um, ensuring that they have viable populations by increasing the connectivity in our forests to establish um, some wildlife uh, conservation urban planning policies, so it's to ensure that future developments will take into consideration of these um, critically endangered animals. And of course, uh, we want to 
step up on the out education and outreach segment because we always believe that education is the key to saving many of these species in Singapore. Right. So the last two animals are even more cryptic than the other two. And in fact, I have not seen this uh, leopard cat in Singapore before myself, even though I've been surveying the forest quite frequently. So compared with the Kologo and the pangolin, the distribution for the leopard cat is actually much more wider. And you can find them from Pakistan and Russia all the way down to Southeast Asia. And within Singapore, their distribution is actually very, very similar to the Sunda pangolins in our the Central Nature Reserve and our Aushaf Islands, as well as the Western Catchment Area. But one difference is that you will never find the leopard cats in the urban areas because they are still very restricted to um, the forest habitats. Right, so how do you identify a leopard cat? Um, the, the leopard cat got its name from the patterns that they have. They have black spots on their body, on their back, on their sides. And um, similar to that, similar to that of leopards, but not exactly, just um, looks alike. But even though it has got um, these patterns like a leopard, the size of the leopard cat is only that of a domestic cat, except that they have much longer legs than them. They do have a round head and large ears, so this will allow them to, um, to hear sounds in the forest at night, which helps them to hunt for food. They also do have four black lines on their forehead. Two of the lines are in the center of the head and the other two lines are actually at the corners of their eyes, extending all the way to their back. For the leopard cats, they also occur mainly in the forest, but they are also known to inhabit oil palm plantations, especially on our offshore islands. And one of the reasons for that is because um, there tend to be more uh, rats and small rodents in the oil palm plantations, which will be a very good source of food for the leopard cats. And like um, most of the cats do, they are also solitary, but especially during the mating season, sometimes you can also find the leopard cats in pairs or even in small families when they give birth to kittens. They are also um, largely ground dwelling, so they are found on the ground, but they can also climb trees during the daytime. For the diet, they are completely opposite that of the Kologos by being purely carnivorous. So they only eat meat consisting of uh, small body breaks such as the frogs, lizards, birds, and uh, sometimes rats. Right. One um, interesting feature about the leopard cat is that every leopard cat individual has a unique coat pattern and a, and a facial feature to it. And this uh, feature is very, very important for researchers because researchers do depend on these patterns to decide whether a leopard cat is, one leopard cat is different from another one. And only when they can tell apart one individual from another, then they can use it to estimate the population size of the leopard cats in the wild. So what do researchers do to identify these leopard cats? So they can do so by comparing the camera trap photographs taken um, from years apart or months apart, and they can compare the patterns on his body and, and his flank, and from that they can tell whether or not it's the same leopard cats. So from the two pictures here, they're actually taken one year apart, and by comparing the detailed uh, morphology of this animal, we can actually um, decide that it is the same individual recorded in the wild. So it's good news because it is due there after a year. Also, um, many people do not know that the Bengal cat is actually a breed produced by crossing the wild leopard cat and the domestic cat. But in Singapore, we only allow Bengal cats from the fifth generation cross um, to be kept. And generations from uh, first to fourth is not allowed. In order to keep the Bengal cats, you also need to produce a documentary proof showing the lineage of the ancestors just to confirm that you're getting Bengal cats from only the fifth generation on above. And this is actually protected by law. So um, uh, depending on whether keeping it or selling it, um, it is protected by um, various steps. Right. So for the leopard cat, the numbers are actually very low, especially in the mainland. 
So its conservation status locally is critically endangered, although worldwide it is least concerned. And um, just late last year in December, you can see that there's a record of two leopard cats being rescued by acres right outside our nature reserves. So you can see that um, the demand for keeping these leopard cats as pets is still out there. It's not common, but we do have this such demands. So um, the illegal poaching and wildlife trade is one of the key factors uh, causing its decline. And besides that, uh, road kill is another factor contributing to it which is similar to our Sunda pangolins. So it can help to stem off this uh, illegal trade by not buying any wild animals to be kept as pets. And in fact, animals do not make very good pets because of the uh, of their habit and, and their diet. If you're a driver, you can also drive carefully along the roads and watch out for the wildlife near the forested areas to ensure that you don't accidentally run over any of these animals. Right. So the last animal that I'll be talking about is what I've been researching so far for the past three to four years. And um, it is no other than the Sunda Solaris. Right. So compared to the other three animals, the distribution of the Sunda Solaris is much, much narrower. And within Southeast Asia, we can only find this animal in Indonesia, Peninsula Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. Within Singapore, they are largely restricted to the Central Catchment Nature Reserve and the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, as well as a, a few of the nature parks. But we also do have a small population of the Sunda Solaris on the Tekong Island. So how do you um, identify a Sunda Solaris? From far, they actually look like little monkeys but without a tail. But um, if you have a chance to look at them clearly, you can find that they have a very distinguishing black brown stripe which is across its back, which is not found in any of the other primates in Singapore. And it also has got quite dense fur, which protects the lorries from the um, stinging plant materials that they like to sleep in during the daytime, such as rattans. They have a very short tail compared with the macaques and the langurs, so short that you don't really get to see them and you think that they are tailless, but they do have a tail. They have a snot, a short snout and a round head and very, very big eyes with a dark ring. So um, a lot of the researchers overseas that um, do surveys on the solaris using the spot lighting technique will say that um, when they do shine a light at the lorises, the eyes will reflect them and the eyes are so big that they, the reflections looks like big flashlights. So it's very, very prominent and easy to identify the solarises in the wild. So as I said, the loris is mainly found in the tropical forests and you don't get to see them in the urban areas. They're solitary, they're arboreal, and during the daytime, they also rose into a ball and sleep on trees as well as tree holes. Now compared with the other mammals, uh, even the other primates, their metabolic rate is much lower. So they don't move around much. Um, and when they do, it's really just to uh, look for food. The diet is a bit more varied. They are omnivores. So they feed on insects, they eat spiders and uh, various parts of the plant, like the gum, sap nectar and the fruits. And in the small picture that you can see here, you can see that this Sunda Solari is actually eating durian flowers or licking the sap from the flowers. So humans and humans and monkeys are not the only uh, animals that like durians in Singapore. Right. One interesting feature about the Solaris is that it is the only venomous primate in Singapore. And in fact, Solarises are the only venomous primates in the whole world. There's no other primates that uh, have this adaptation. For the loris, it has got glands on its elbow, which can secrete a yellowish substance. And when they use the saliva to combine with this substance, it will activate the venom in it. And when the solaris proceeds to bite another small animal or predator that's trying to eat it, they will inject the poison into them and sometimes they cause their death. So if you see a solaris um, raising up both of his hands, in this uh, stance similar to the Wonder Woman, it's, it's not trying to act cute, but it's trying to kill you. 
So the lorries also uses this uh, same venom to protect their babies. And they do so by licking the entire body of their, of their babies, such that if a predator comes near and they attempt to eat it, they'll be, po they will be um, poisoned. Right. And the name Stow Lorries definitely doesn't do justice to this animal because despite being called a slow lorries, they can actually move pretty fast from tree to tree. And they can do so by moving on four limbs. And uh, for the lorries, what happens is that their second digit on their hand is actually much reduced. And this will allow them to grab on the different plant parts so that they can move around in um, a very agile manner from tree to tree. And they can also change directions silently without any reduction in speed. So this is a video taken of a tall lorries moving down a tree. And you can see uh, how he uses his arms to grab onto the plant parts to get around. This is still pretty slow. I've seen them moving much faster than this. But this is a good uh, illustration of how they can use their, their, their digits, their fingers to grab onto things. And you can also see that the eyes are very big in the wild, right? So all these videos are actually taken using the night vision equipment that Jim has mentioned just now. And this equipment is something similar to like a video recorder, except that you can take footage of the animals in totally no light conditions because they tend to detect the animals by the, the thermal signals emitted by them and the movement instead of uh, light. Okay. For the lorries, um, locally it is critically endangered. We don't have a lot of them in our core nature reserves and worldwide it is vulnerable. So uh, in last December, we had a report um, that one of the stole lorises has been rescued right near the borders of the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And the sad thing about this is that uh, upon examination, the vets found that the teeth of the stole loris has actually been found down. So this is a very, very good um, evidence to show that the loris has been captured to be kept as a pet because the owner doesn't want to be bitten by the loris during the day-to-day -day handlings. And... Um, because of how cute they look like, um, the number one threat uh, to them is illegal poaching and the wildlife trade in other parts of the world as well. So you can help them by not buying the wild animals to be kept as pets and also do not harvest any plants or plant parts from the forest. So I know that you might like durians a lot, but please try to save it for the other animals. Right. Luckily for the stole lorries, uh, we do have a species report, a recovery program, which was mentioned by Jim just now, as part of the NPAX Nature Conservation Master Plan. And the Sunda stole lorries is actually one of the animals that is currently under this program. The aim of this uh, species recovery program is to conserve all these critically endangered flora and fauna through various efforts. So. For the lorries, um, part of the program is actually doing extensive distribution studies of it because um, there's actually always there's only been one comprehensive survey done on the lorries in um, the early 2000s, and no studies have been followed up after that. So for the past three to four years, um, I've been doing a survey of the lorries in the nature reserve, the nature area, so trying to find out where they can actually be found. And we also study their behavior and especially the diet to know which are the trees that they usually sleep in and feed on. So we hope that through such uh, efforts, we can eventually increase the connectivity in the forest and grow more of their food plants so that um, they have more food to eat and hopefully their population will increase over time. Right, so you might think that uh, I'm not a researcher. I might not have taken any um, animal modules in the school and I don't even know about animals in Singapore. So what can I do, you know, to help conserve these animals? And the truth is actually you can do a lot simply by doing nothing. So you can help them by not visiting our nature reserves after the daylight hours because you don't want to create any disturbance to the wildlife, uh, especially after dark. You can avoid going into the non-vaccinated areas because you might be trampling on their nests or on their food items when they come out and for food at night. And being nocturnal, it also means that these animals are more sensitive to noises and to light. So if you use flash photography at them, it might actually hurt the, their eyes. 
Of course, if you're very lucky to find a wild animal outside, what you can do is don't approach it to take a nicer photo, but only look at it from a safe distance so that the animals don't feel threatened and it will not uh, affect their daily lives. And lastly, it's very important not to feed them, especially with human food, because this might upset their health. And also worse, it might make them acclimatize to eating human food, which will lead to a whole uh, different set of problems in the future. Additionally, uh, you can do so by not supporting the illegal wildlife trade and also keeping off uh, wildlife as pets. Um, because actually wildlife, they are not that suitable for domestic uh, life. So they generally don't do well in captivity. And if you can't find a suitable diet for it, uh, they will just deteriorate both, both physically and psychologically over time. If you want to keep a pet, you can do that by purchasing one from the licensed pet shops. And, in, and better still, you can support the local animal welfare groups and take part in their adoption events to adopt a pet that is waiting for a forever home. If you spot a wild animal, you can submit a sighting record to the SG BioAlice, which is a database, database collecting all the sightings for both animals and plants in Singapore. And of course, if you want to know more about why you shouldn't keep uh, wildlife as a pet, you can always go to our recently updated MPARC website, and the link is here. Right. So for that, I've come to the end of my talk and I hope that you enjoy listening to it and learn about a thing or two about these amazing animals in Singapore. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you, Tian Jiao, for sharing with us about a variety of uh, nocturnal animals that we have in Singapore. So we'll just uh, quickly do a Q&A. So uh, thanks to all those who submitted questions, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll only just address one of them. So the question is, why are these nocturnal mammals important to our ecosystem? Tian Jiao? Right, so um, there are many reasons why um, these mammals are important. And one of the most prominent reasons is that these animals that feed on plant parts, they feed on fruits, they tend to be dispersals for our plant parts. So they will help to disperse its seed and eventually help to regenerate our forest. And for the apex predators, such as the leopard cats, they also feed on rats in the um, icon plantations and in our forest. And doing so, they will help to um, control the populations of these rodents in our natural habitat. Right. For the pangolins, because they feed on ants and termites, they also help to control the population of these uh, insects in our ecosystem, such that they won't um, be overpopulated and has detrimental effects to the forest. So these are some of the reasons why they are important. All right, thank you, Tian Jiao, for summarizing. So to the rest who submitted questions, thank you so much. But I'm afraid that um, we have reached the end of today's NPARC Spotlight session. Thank you all for joining us and for staying with us. So we hope you learned something new and that it helps you to better appreciate the creatures of the night that call Singapore home. So our next two NPARC Spotlight Talks have been fully subscribed, but if you are interested, do look out for updates on recordings or live stream links on NPARC's social media pages. You can also scan the QR code on the screen to find out more about this, this series and look out for more talks coming up in July as well. So thank you all once again for joining us this morning. Have a good weekend.